hey, we're finally getting around to the Spitfire. So this is a Patreon request from John Burcham. He says, I'm a bit biased because I love Spitfire, but I would recommend Spitfire, a 1975 BBC documentary that can be found on YouTube. I think it's too old and unpopular <laughs> for copyright problems. Appreciate it. Never like dealing with those pesky copyright issues. It's basically about the development of the fighter that has plenty of interviews with the designers, test pilots, and fighter pilots. Definitely the most beautiful plane ever, possibly with the exception of the F-35. All that needs now is the RAF to give it a decent name. I guess you mean the F-35 needs a decent name. So the fact that this documentary is about um, interviews with like the designers, test pilots, and fighter pilots, so the people that developed the plane and helped uh, to test it, make sure it works. I actually like documentaries like that because I just love hearing about the engineering, the background of the engineering and how they come up with all of this stuff. So this should be enjoyable. It is long. It's about an hour long. We're going to split it up into three parts. Now, I have not seen anything about the Spitfire before. I'm sure I've seen it in passing in some of the videos without realizing it. I have heard it quite a bit mentioned in other videos. So, so I know it's like a really famous plane, but I've never learned about it before. But without further ado, let's go ahead and let's check out the Spitfire. <laughs> Does that door just come off? It's almost exactly 35 years since I first sat in the cockpit of a Spitfire. I was wearing these clothes, including this scarf. I was 19, scared stiff, and fiercely proud to be flying the most beautiful and finest aeroplane in the world. It was never the most comfortable, but that didn't matter. This was a superb fighting aeroplane, and it was a pilot's dream. The story of the Spitfire, which we're going to tell, isn't just a film scenario of a designer working alone inspired by seagulls. Thousands of people all over Britain take part in it. We shall be meeting designers, factory workers, engineers, who toiled for months on end in 1940 without a break to get the Spitfires into the sky. The story begins 200 miles from this historic fighter station at Coltishall in Norfolk. The river Itchin in Southampton today carries the hovercraft, another example of British inventive genius. In the 1920s, the thriving firm of Supermarine built flying boats and seaplanes here. Their chief designer was R.J. Mitchell, who provided the seaplane which won the Schneider Trophy for Britain. He went on to the peak of his brilliance by designing the Spitfire, and as all the world knows, he died tragically soon after in 1937. Okay, so he keeps mentioning the Supermarine. Is that a, uh, I guess, a design firm? It seems like he just implied that. So would that be like um, uh, the equivalent of like uh, the American, you know, Lockheed Martin or that kind of thing? His son stands on the ramp where Supermarine sleek seaplanes entered the water to compete for the world's speed record in 1931. The last time that I was standing on this slipway, was about 45 years ago. I remember well the anguish and tension which my father showed uh, when the Snyder Trophy planes were wheeled out and the engines revved up. This to me was something which, um, although I was so young, was a very potent memory. I remember the uh, large floats, the big silver wings. This was all to me for a boy of seven or eight, as I was then, something of very great excitement. I perhaps wasn't aware of the real significance of what was going on, but nevertheless, I do remember these situations and tensions very, very well. The RAF team had two seaplanes designed by Mitchell to capture the Snyder Trophy outright. The attempt was sponsored by Lady Houston with a gift of £100,000, and she kept alive a partnership between Mitchell and Sir Henry Royce. His firm was responsible for providing a winning power unit. This. Okay, <laughs> what is the Schneider Trophy? Pie unit? Is that what he said? So Henry Roy Royce is that, so he's probably the guy behind Rolls Royce, right? Our engine and had the temperament of a thoroughbred. On the night before an earlier race, the Rolls Royce engineers had faced a most unusual crisis. They discovered the night before the race that one of the cylinder, the cylinder blocks had seized. That's right. And, um, you had to go around and collect all the chaps that we'd taken down to change this block. And we had to get one special man who was left-handed because it happened to be a block where only a left-handed man could undo the nuts and bolts to change it. Difficult. What? So that um, 
Uh, Cyril was was there, and they went round by taxi and got the police force out, I think, to collect these chaps. who would all had a grand booze up, you know, preparatory to the day out, you know. <laughs> so they were they drunk. Were all, and somebody switched their shoes around in the hotel so that nobody knew the right boots. Anyway, they got them all together, and they changed the cylinder block overnight, which is a considerable job, because the rules were that you could do this, but you couldn't take the engine out of the aeroplane. So this is a race. That was the rule. So they had to do it in situ in the S6 right. aeroplane. It was done overnight, and the next day, of course, the aeroplane uh, won the race and won the Snyder Trophy for, for England. The for S England, so it's an international thing, I guess. So, I mean, Snyder's like German. Uh, Ger is, is it a German name? So it's just like an international plane race. Six B1, and Mitchell made a rare broadcast about the real value of his triumph. It is not good enough to follow conventional methods of design. It is essential to break new ground and to invent and involve new methods and new ideas. The important aim of the designer is to reduce air resistance. The cooling of the engine presents many interesting features. The usual methods employed, either by air cooling or by means of honeycomb radiators, have very high air resistance. On the S6B, the engine is cooled without adding any air resistance. The cooling water is circulated over both surfaces of the wings and most of the surface of the floats. During flight, heat equivalent to a thousand horsepower is being given to the air from these surfaces. The S6 feet has been aptly described as a flying radiator. For the present, however, it is generally considered that high-speed development has served its purpose. It has accumulated an enormous amount of information which is now being used to improve the breed of everyday aircraft. It is helping to develop our great airliners and ocean-going flying boats, and is thus bringing closer together the outlying parts of the British Empire. This okay, I was hoping he was going to explain what the purpose of this was, because these planes all have the, um, I don't know what you call them, the floaties, they'll let them, they're not floaties, but you know what I mean, they can skirt on the water. Why are they all designed like that? Like what, explain this plane to me. This indeed is an objective worthy of all our greatest efforts. These mementos of success are as modest as Mitchell himself, the man from Stoke-on-Trent who moved to Southampton where he made his home and his reputation. The government made him a CBE, but never a knight. As a man, I liked him enormously and respected him because he was tremendously well known. I mean, he had a huge reputation after the Snyder Trophy seaplanes. To me, he was a sort of... Uh, well, sort of wonder man. But, of course, if you really look back on it and you go through the history of the Schneider Trophy series of seaplanes, the, the sea Mitchell plane. and the team which he had built up around him, which, instant was a very young team, if you go back, very young team. These chaps, after the S4 and the S5 and the two S6s and all the world speed records and everything else, these fellows knew more about high-speed aeronautics than any other design team in the world, I think it is fair to say. Everybody got a bit of a lift from working with Mitchell because uh, of the success which accompanied his efforts, and uh, he was a good leader, in other words. It is entirely logical and to, that he produced something like a Spitfire. In fact, it would have been rather surprising if he hadn't. Air Marshal Dowding invited Vickers Supermarine and Mitchell to design a fighter, but in the peaceful 30s, the government had little enthusiasm for defense. They ignored the ominous rabble rising in Germany, where a nation was being harnessed to a war machine training in secret. Britain's ancient biplane fighters were slower than the Luftwaffe's bombers. The RAF needed more killing power. Scott and Edith Sawley worked out in tremendous detail and technically that with the rate of fire and the number of guns you had, that a two-second burst was the uh, ideal short burst as you were coming into the attack astern of an enemy aircraft. You were overtaking pretty fast usually. Two seconds when you came in range of 200 yards was about the ideal time to push the button and all the guns fire. Mitchell drew on his own experience with the RAF high-speed flight and turned to his friends at Rolls-Royce. They were already developing a new breed of aero engine. We were hoping, of course, that, that we would get an airplane that would do at least 300 miles an hour. 
And of course, there was great excitement in the drawing office at the, uh, at the prospects of uh, designing an engine that would produce the power required to produce that speed. Uh, that 300 miles an hour. That's slow compared to today. I mean, obviously they were developing it, but what was the average speed of planes at this time? I'd actually never had thought about that. So these, these still have propellers. So I guess they're still propeller planes, which would limit the amount of uh, speed, right? You need jets to go faster than that. See, I don't really know much about <laughs> what's the difference between jets. Are they use like some sort of rocket technology, right? What what makes a jet a jet compared to a plane like this? Also, the Rolls Royce thing. Growing up, the only time I'd ever heard of Rolls Rolls Royce was their cars. And the first time I learned that they made plane engines, I was like, what? What I'm gathering from this is that Rolls Royce is more known for their their engines. I don't really know the history of it, so. At the time, of course, we had the Kestrel engine. We felt that we wanted a somewhat larger engine. We had the engine known as the R, which was the engine that won Snyder Trophy in 1929, but that, that was a 20% scale up dimensionally of the, of the Kestrel engine, but was thought at that time to be rather too big. So we decided that we would want an engine that was somewhere intermediate between the Kestrel and the R. And this, this was how the, the Merlin engine came, came to be started. Rolls-Royce built this 12-cylinder engine, the Merlin, as a private venture. R.J. Mitchell of Supermarine chose it for the Spitfire. Sydney Cam of Hawkers chose it for the Hurricane. The Hurricane first flew in November 1935 and went immediately into production. The Spitfire first flew at Eastleigh on the 5th of March 1936. This prototype was the first of 20,300 Spitfires and over 2,000 Seafires. R.J. Mitchell sat with his team more tense than he looked. There were two test pilots, Jeffrey Quill on the right and Mutt Summers, who first flew the Spitfire. Do these test pilots have a way to eject at this point in history, just in case? <laughs> because these guys have to be like super brave to do this. And then Matt Summers took off, and it wasn't long before he disappeared completely from view in the heavens above. And uh, after a suitable interval, he returned, and he made a very characteristic side slip landing, which on a new aeroplane was perhaps a bit surprising. Jumped out of the aeroplane, and I think RJ stepped forward and expected uh, some figures on a piece of paper. And Matt Summers said, it's, it's a good aeroplane. First thing, I used to look down and as I was on the circuit and I would nearly always see old Mitchell's yellow Rolls Royce either just driving in through the gate or parked on the tarmac. And um, as soon as uh, I taxied in, he was always there, the, the, the sort of debriefing people we used to come around, but old Mitchell was always around, hovering around in the background. If we were going to fly it again, he always used to invite me to go and sit in his car and talk to him or sometimes we'd go off and have a cup of coffee. And I well remember him uh, jokingly taking a bet with one of the test pilots, I think it was, uh, that the Spitfire would exceed the speed of the Hurricane by at least 30 miles an hour. And of course, uh, um, this was all taken very lightheartedly, but events showed that uh, this was certainly a good bet. Why was the Spitfire faster than the Hurricane? Well, Mitchell knew from his Schneider Trophy experience that frontal area had to be cut down and he determined on the thinnest possible wings for the Spitfire clad in stressed aluminum. The wing had to be thick enough to contain the wheels when retracted and to carry eight 303 machine guns for either side. Add fuel tanks and controls and you can see it would have been easier to have a thicker wing. And Mitchell was told that having a thinner wing wouldn't make very much difference but he insisted on the perfect aerofoil shape and history proved him right. Hang on, I need to check and see. I don't I don't remember. I don't remember what the hurricane looks like. Hawker hurricane. So Hawker is another design firm, I guess. It looks like a Spitfire. I remember somebody pointing out the different, like the hurricane, like how you can um, identify them during the, the wing design is different. Hurricane has, Spitfires were like rounded wings, like this up here, like rounded wings. And then Hurricane has 
these longer what about the tail though does the tail look tail looks very similar though but the wings are different for sure so i guess that's the main reason or the main way to, to tell them apart is just looking at the shape of the wings in 1933 it was discovered that my father had cancer and he had to go into hospital and have a major operation it left him with a very grave physical disability and also of course uh, he knew that there was every chance that the illness would uh, reoccur and he was told that if it occurred within four years um, there was nothing probably that could be done and i think the relevant point is that it was during this period when he designed the spitfire and later still the uh, four engine bomber which was designed and put into bu building the prototype mm. but was subsequently destroyed in an air raid over southampton but it was towards the end of 1936 that it became obvious uh, that my father was far from well and in fact it was soon realized that the cancer had returned and although he bravely continued and went to vienna for special treatment in may of 1937 but he returned and he died about three weeks later mm, so we never really got to see his plane in action huh? Mitchell's giant bomber was never produced. The Spitfire was his dynamic epitaph. In 1936, Hitler chose a fighter for his new Luftwaffe. It was the BF-109 designed by Willy Messerschmitt. Cheap to build and very fast. In 1937, it broke the world's land plane record at 380 miles an hour, using an engine souped up almost to destruction. Goering and Messerschmitt let the world believe it was their standard fighter. Hitler gave highest priority to bombers, and he failed to produce sufficient fighters. He hoped for cooperation with Britain. Indeed, the Luftwaffe actually disclosed true production figures to the RAF. The Luftwaffe's General Milch visited our aircraft factories. His diary notes the consternation he caused by asking, how are your experiments with the radio detection of aircraft? Why are, why are the British letting the Germans come in and basically spy on them? What, what is going on? Why are they exchanging information like this? I vaguely remember seeing something about this in one of the documentaries I watched. Maybe it was on Patreon with the World of War, but I can't remember what the circumstances were and why they were doing this. The Luftwaffe's Stukas and Messerschmitts were blooded in the Spanish Civil War. Dive bombers were fitted with screaming sirens to add terror to destruction. The Blitzkrieg machine was tuned for war. It really is a scary sound. The Royal Air sound. Force trained new pilots on hurricanes and spitfires. Clearly, there was not to be peace in our time. After the Munich crisis of 1938, auxiliaries and reservists were writing a new chapter of air history. I would hate it, uh, to have gone to war myself in uh, 1938 because I wasn't trained. And I think the year we had between Munich and uh, 1939 just gave us the time to get things uh, better organized, get more fighter squadrons, better train, that sort of thing. And I think had we have fought in 1938, the outcome might have been well, uh, a lot different. There were 5,000 of we chaps and the 5,000 uh, embryo pilots in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve in the summer of 1939, and we all wanted to be fighter pilots to fly the Spitfire. <laughs> but the RAF had only one squadron of Spitfires, five squadrons of Hurricanes, and 23 squadrons with outdated aircraft. Spitfires were slow to come from the production lines. Vickers Supermarine was struggling with an order for 310. They had never tackled more than 25 aircraft at once. They were craftsmen, skilled in making seaplanes and flying boats, not mass-produced fighters of revolutionary design. We're going to uh, call it there. 
for part one. So we've made it up through the design of the plane. Unfortunately, the designer passed away before he got to kind of see his um, creation being used. So he was mentioning squadrons. How many planes make up a squadron? I don't really have a concept of how many planes that is. 310 planes also seems like a low number for World War II. Because I, like, I know the numbers of like planes and ships and all of that stuff was just like insanely large back then. I don't know, like I guess every military had uh, different capabilities as far as like manufacturing went and stuff. So. so it was cool to learn about the British design firms. So Haw Hawken, Hawker and um, Supermarine because I'd never heard of them before. And I was glad that I was uh, able to look up the, the two planes, the Spitfire and the Hurricane and get that more solidified in my head with, with the wing shape and how to identify those. What I don't know is like the difference between the Hurricane and the Spitfire were they used for two are, are they both fighters or they were they used together during like the same campaigns for the same reasons or were they was one better at something than the other and so they were kind of like divvied up that way which one had the bigger impact on World War II did they both have kind of a similar impact so what's gonna be interesting in part two is seeing so they're gonna have to go to this like mass production of these planes so seeing how they're the engineers are going to work that out how they're going to figure out how to get these planes out a lot faster that should be interesting to see what changes they make because that's kind of like what my grandfather used to do he was a mechanical engineer but he ended up working more in, in industrial engineering in manufacturing and trying to optimize all of that it's interesting hearing him tell stories about that so the, we'll have a lot of that i guess happening in the next part hope you guys come back for a part two look forward to your comments below. Please answer my questions if you can, as always. And we will take a look at your comments for answers in part two. So Roger, Scarlet, and I, there's Scarlet. Say hi to everybody. Say hello. Yes, there you go. We appreciate you watching as always, and we'll see you next time.